today I'll be talking about my thesis research project uh, entitled Simulating Spatial Distribution of Wind Deposited Snow. And specifically, I'll be using UAV, uh, which is Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, uh, synonymous with the drone, uh, more commonly used. And uh, Structure for Motion is the uh, technology. Uh, and also using snow models, similar to what David said, uh, same, same premise there, uh, model uh, generated by Dr. Glenn Liston in Colorado and specifically in Mount Washington. Uh, so also I'd like to uh, thank uh, UNH for the support as well as Krell, the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab. This is a, a, a Department of Defense uh, engineering lab over in Hanover, New Hampshire, and they've supported this project in a few ways. And also the Mount Washington Avalanche Center, Pat and the uh, Ryan and the rest of the forecasters have been very helpful and, and supportive through this process. So first, I'd like just to uh, to begin with the UNH land acknowledgement. This is their statement they put out for, uh, this is their kind of statement for New Hampshire. And I'd just like to recognize that I, I connected research on the Pinnacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki people's land. So I really uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that to start. So first, I'm going to move into a little bit of a outline for today's uh, presentation. I'm going to start with a little bit of some product motivation and, and background then uh, move into the study area and field data collection methods, then move into the field data processing and results section, then the uh, talk about the snow model processing results, and finally conclude with some conclusions and future work that I'll be conducting. So there's a, a copious amount of, of uh, acronyms for this line of work. So here's just a, a list, just throwing them at you. Don't feel like you need to know or read all of them, but just here they are. Uh, I'll go over them as they come up, uh, but this is just a whole whole list of a bunch of different acronyms and things. Some of them might be familiar or not. So how how did I get into the, doing this project? What is how did this all come about? Uh, here's here's a slide just talk about my motivation. I took ARI one uh, in uh, 2019, and I'm planning to take ARI two this year. Uh, over a couple of years of backcountry skiing in Northeast, I started to develop uh, awareness for avalanches and snowpack assessment and terrain management, and also uh, some coursework at UNH, uh, snow hydrology, and some of the more uh, academic side of things. I, I became interested in how, what you can learn about snow and, and reeling that into this project. Uh, I'm also interested in drone flying and, and other mountain sports cinematography. So how can all those kind of connect in a way, a former project that I'm really interested in. So this is kind of the, the fuel for, for this project. And on the right, you'll see a picture of me uh, collecting a, a uh, for that uh, CSO uh, using the scope is uh, propagation labs, as David mentioned, this is the app, but the scope is a specific uh, instrument that propagation labs developed it is a digital snow penetrometer. And here's a, uh, it's a really interesting uh, piece of technology that you probe down and then it uploads this profile to your phone uh, within a matter of seconds. And it's pretty much uh, equivalent to the hand hardness uh, scale. So you can see the density profile without having to dig a full pit and poke it and kind of measure where your pokes are. So it's a really interesting way to get a lot of quick, fast uh, measurements. So that was something I was enjoying uh, testing and through here and, and the Chick Shocks this past winter. More, more on that to come uh, testing this winter time. So now let's reel in the product a little bit more to specific wind slabs. Here's a great GIF created by the National Avalanche Center, just kind of illustrating how, how these things come about. Uh, wind essentially is blown from windward fetch areas into the lee slopes. So it's blowing downwind. You can see the area of the wind and, and where the snow is collecting. These uh, slabs form really dense. And, uh, and when, when these slabs are situated over a really sugary snow, we call it faceted, uh, really sharp crystals uh, that become, that's a unstable layer. And uh, this really dense layer over this unstable layer causes instability. So a collapse of this weak layer uh, and a fracture propagation across a slope, either natural or skier triggered, uh, will, will initiate an avalanche. And although the uh, density profile, so that dense, that uh, dense slab over that un, uh, uh, weak slab is really important, another two metrics that are very important are depth and extent. And this kind of helps reel in and, and understand the, uh, the quantity risk for the avalanche problem. So that's kind of where I'm 
I, I noticed that those two factors are important and can be measured. So uh, now to, to frame the project a bit more, Mount Washington definitely has avalanches. Uh, there, it's it's limited. It's, it's some of the uh, a lot of the terrain is is uh, just around Mount Washington, the steep glacial cirques, uh, mostly on the east aspect, but also there's some in the west. But um, there have been 17 fatalities over the, the recorded history. And uh, just to show that it does happen, and it's a small community uh, in relation to uh, Colorado and other western areas, but they do happen. Uh, but something that makes uh, Mount Washington very unique is their wind speed and, and it's the high uh, have a record or, or something for the highest uh, recorded wind speed I think it's 231 or so uh, by a human uh, but in the winter time an average wind doesn't really dip below 40 mile, miles an hour it's around the average for December through wow. April so this is a uh, you know and combining with a modest amount of snow 281 is uh, is around average but uh, with that coupling, that really high wind speed and that uh, that snow de snowfall really is a perfect storm for for a, a lot of wind slab generation. So, and also I just want to point out that uh, Mount Washington Avalanche Center is amazing at posting general uh, daily forecasts, and that the winds are almost coming out of the west entirely. So now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my study area. This is uh, just a map I generated. There's two areas here. You'll kind of notice this, this is the uh, Summit Cone and, and the eastern sides of uh, Mount Washington, uh, 100 foot contours on it. The red outline is the Tuckerman Ravine bounds for uh, from one study area. Another one is BSG, which I, I uh, call it's it's the Boot Spur Gullies region, consisting of Hillmans and the lower snowfield. And uh, and the large box there is the snow model input area. So that's uh, I'll talk about snow model in in the coming slides, but that's just a uh, just to frame where where that's going in. So now, if you're not familiar with the area, here's just a Google Earth screenshot with the with the bounds overlaid. Uh, you can see it's uh, Tux has predominantly eastern uh, eastern aspect, uh, with a little bit of south southeast and a little bit of northeast mixed in. And Bootsburg Gullies is also a similar aspect as well. You can see that summit cone kind of poking up on the right. Uh, and then just to frame it again a little bit more, uh, here's the pictures in the wintertime, BSG on the left and uh, Tux on the right. Uh, it's a very well-known glacial cirque. A lot of people come out there in, in the spring for for uh, the snow because uh, quite a bit of snow ends up with all the avalanche debris and, and how much gets transported in. But just want to talk a little bit about how how Mount Washington in this specific area, Taco River oh. being gets so much snow accumulation is really responsible from this big low lawn. It's this really large fetch area that's almost entirely flat. It's uh, situated directly above uh, due west of the ravine. So in this image, the wind is coming kind of straight at us in the screen. And that really blows all the snow into the tucks uh, that would normally land in the big low lawn area. And here's just another visualization. This is April 3rd, so in pretty sizable depth. Uh, for the season, you can see there's almost no snow in in the Bigelow Lawn area, uh, and that just goes to show. And the wind is pretty much pushing all of it down down slope. So there's a little bit of setup of kind of what goes on. Wind slabs are definitely prevalent. Almost all the snow accumulating in in this area is a wind slab. Most of it, it's very rare that it'll, it, the storm will roll in. We'll get a bunch of snow without wind, and if you are, you're, you're lucky to ski it. But uh, how can we do how can we measure these so the first research question i have is can digital surface models i'll talk a bit more about what that is in the next slide uh, be generated to determine wind slab depth and extent and this will be done with a uav uh, and the next question is can snow model be harnessed to create snow depth maps comparable to uav data so this snow model doesn't require any uh, in situ or ground based sample so my main goal is to see if this model can be used to take place of the UAV and create a similar map that will uh, will show these wind slab depth and extents uh, without needing to be there and fly. And finally, can the culmination of these tools uh, be used to gen uh, contribute to avalanche forecast generation, not just also Mount Washington Avalanche Center, but over in other areas, uh, this could be scalable. So this technology I mentioned in the beginning, structure for motion, what is it, how does it work? Uh, 
essentially the motion part is moving perspective. So you can see there's a camera, it's moving and taking pictures of an object. The, within every perspective, you can see these red dots. It sees these red dots uh, from different perspectives and it uh, finds them, they're called tie points. These tie points are, are then found, this is the computer algorithm finding these tie points uh, between photos. And with the IMU, it's an inertial measurement unit and GPS uh, on the drone themselves, they allow accurate camera positions. They know exactly where the photo was taken and they're able to triangulate with these points and the uh, camera po position so that the depth can be generated. So this is a 3D point cloud. You can see that's below Osakam Naveen and all of the uh, photos where, the, where they were taken above. And another one of the really useful outputs is the digital surface model, which you can think of it really as just a topography map. Uh, it's a raster image. So every uh, point, it's, uh, it's around a five centimeter resolution. So really, really fine resolution uh, for the huge area, relatively large area. Uh, is really fine resolution. So you got a measurement every five cent real life centimeters. And another one is the orthophoto, which is the stitching together of all of the high resolution photos into one really large high resolution photo. So it has the resolution, five same five centimeters per pixel resolution, uh, but it's over the entire area. So this is really useful for uh, just looking at the surface conditions, seeing what features are filled in or not, and uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the other uses in the coming slides. But how do we collect this data? How do we get these nice outputs? This is the UAV platform that I use. It's the DJI Phantom 4 RTK edition. And really the only thing that, uh, the only sensor on it was just a regular optical in, uh, camera. So it was a 20 megapixel, 84 degree field of view uh, to kind of describe that. And the main way that these photos can be such so accurate is that the RTK is this extra little uh, sensor on the top of the, the UAV there, and that connects to this base station. You can see in the right image, the DRTK2 mobile base station. And when I upload a point that was collected previously, then the all the layers will stack so that they were they're accurate. Uh, but they're actually around one centimeter positional accuracy is pretty, pretty, pretty fine. So uh, the the drone knows actually exactly where it is uh, up to one centimeter, and uh, and the ground sampling distance GSD I was getting is around one centimeter as well. So this is essentially uh, in a photo taken from the drone, what is the uh, every pixel equates to one real life centimeter on the ground. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how these uh, flights are actually conducted. So first I had to create the flight plan using the DJI proprietary software built into the remote. Uh, had to use to wear, terrain awareness mode, because if you're familiar with the FAA, there's a regulation that you need to stay uh, 400 meters above the ground level. And in this really rapid changing elevation setting, I need to stay at a consistent height. I can't just fly 400 above the top or else I'll be a uh, 1,000 feet or so above the floor of the ravine. So uh, I need to upload uh, SRTM data. It's a shuttle radar topography mission around 30 meter resolution satellite uh, or shuttle data and uh, and then create the flight plan based off of that. So here's uh, some screenshots. Structure motion is most effective when it's flown at a double grid. So it's this double lawnmower back and forth kind of pattern. Each of these flights took around 18 to 20 minutes or so, depending on some conditions. Uh, and and they took around 400 photos per flight. And I was flying at a 45 meter uh, height above the ground and then at a five, uh, speed of 5.3 meters a second. And an interesting thing, you can kind of see how the uh, terrain, uh, how the profile goes as it's completing the flight path. Similar, similar sort of plan for Bootsburg Gully's area. Uh, this was a little bit smaller, just a square footage type area. So. Uh, I was able to fly a little bit lower and a little bit slower to get a even finer resolution, uh, which was the desired goal. So we got this now, but what's the process of actually collecting this data? Tux is pretty uh, fairly remote as as uh, study areas go in in this field. So I had to hike or ski depending on the trail conditions, two and a half miles up the Tuckerman Trail, and with all the gear, it's it was around thirty to forty pounds depending on how many batteries I took uh, and all rigged up to my ski pack. 
Then I would set up the base station and link it with the UAV, load the flight plan and execute. It was as simple as just sliding and, and it took off by itself. It would do the flight plan. It would know exactly when the battery was low enough and it couldn't complete anymore. So it would fly back to the home point. And most of the time I'd have to land it manually or, or catch it in the air as the uh, picture behind me is showing. Uh, and then I would repeat for the other study area and descend the trail if, if it was in. And it got kind of desperate when it wasn't in. So it was definitely got some some scratches on the bases, but that's, that's just how it goes. So uh, first we need some baseline data. So we need snow off conditions. We need uh, the snow off to get the uh, snow depth. So first I collected monument points with the R2K GPS session that I created. Uh, it's a separate system that has around one to five centimeter positional accuracy, just so I had a known location to set up that RTK base station for the uh, for the UAV, um, which is set up here. And that's you'll see in some other images. That's the uh, base station that connects with the drone. So two different RTK systems, but the one moving forward is the uh, is the is the UAV connected one. And then also an interesting thing was uh, Krell provided a TLS scanner, which uh, TLS is Telestrial uh, Laser Scanner, which is essentially a ground-based LIDAR. So if you're familiar, as uh, David said earlier, LIDAR, it sends out pulses of light and then it uh, times how long it takes it for it to reflect off the object or whatever it hits and then come back and, and hit the sensor again. And doing a simple speed of light calculation, you can get the distance away. So. Both study areas were scanned using this, and this was a served as a validation of my of my uh, ground my, my baseline UAV measurements. So here's just a summary of the completed flights over the season. I did 15 in, in Tuckerman Ravine and uh, 13 for the Bootsburg Gullies area. Sometimes it was one of them was was able to be flown, one of them was not. Bootsburg Gullies, which was, was a little bit more sheltered by the wind, I started from a lower elevation. But I, I preferred to fly Tuckerman Ravine because that was where the most interesting things were happening. And, and I tried to take also a, a picture from a similar perspective by Connection Cache uh, just to kind of see a, a visual time series of, of all the days I flew from, from the early season on to the spring. Just let that run again. Yeah, there's that avalanche. And yep, yeah, okay. So now, obviously, with collecting data on Mount Washington, there's going to be some problems. So uh, drones are not really meant to fly here. This is a really difficult area to collect data. Uh, as we all know, it, things change very quickly up there. So I can go up and, you know, I can forecast only 10 to 20 miles an hour wind and, and it would go up and it'd be blowing 30 and gusts to 40 randomly, or sometimes it would just be still. You never know and the clouds would roll in and out. So that was difficult to, to compare, especially when I'm a two hour drive up from Durham, uh, where UNH is, and then, and then the hike up, uh, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of different moving parts. Uh, with the temperatures in January, the thick of it, this is a, a picture of the MWAB's uh, report from January 4th, where the wind chill was apparently rising to 10 or 20 below, which is really not uncommon in, in the dead of January and up there, but that Electronics don't really like cold temperatures like that, so it was uh, always a challenge to keep the batteries warm before they were in the, the drone. They were able to stay warm once they were being used and cycled, but uh, I had to blow on them and keep them in my jacket and use all the hand warmers to keep them warm in the time being. And also, with the just just uh, transporting the data, the uh, equipment, sorry, was difficult. It was uh, a lot of, of work to get it up there, but thankfully I had assistance from the uh, forecasters at, at times I was able to get a snowmobile lift or even a, uh, the snowcat uh, one time was was very useful and made that trip much much easier and last the, the just the trials and tribulations of using this technology sometimes each connection would just drop out of nowhere so it, the pictures wouldn't get a uh, accurate positional tag so I would have to restart everything and, and do it again which was really frustrating sometimes so uh Next, we can talk a little bit about this past winter and summer. Here's some graphs I made from the Mount Washington Observatory data. This is just a daily average of the temperature. You can see the, the freezing line on there. And uh, generally, it was a pretty warm winter. There were a couple, a couple weird days in, in February and, and March where it spiked above freezing. 
a bunch and even brought with some rain, which is slightly pretty uncharacteristic for uh, for this area. But uh, and then moving into the wind, you can really see it's almost entirely out of the west, west northwest or so. That's pretty common. All the storm tracks kind of move in that direction. And uh, also, these are daily average wind speeds. And just to know, it's really doesn't go below 20 miles an hour ever for a daily average. And this is just a daily average. So maybe it can howl over the night and then be still at day. So there were definitely some days that were sub 20 miles an hour. But just to put in reference, usually UAVs do best below 20 miles an hour is kind of a threshold, the sweet spot for uh, for how much they can fight against the wind. So that was definitely a challenge to, to plan that. And now here's the snow plot. This was only running to uh, March, uh, April 25th. I think we got a little bit of snow after it, but it was around 230 or so uh, inches, uh, which is 587 centimeters. And opposed to an average of 281, definitely a low snow year all around, uh, especially mixed in some of those rain events. We had some mid-season melt as well. Uh, kind of made for some weird, weird data collection, but maybe it was a blessing in disguise because there were days that I could fly, which is uh, in a typical winter, maybe I wouldn't be able to fly as many days as I as I was able to. Uh, so, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about actually the processing itself of the structure for motion. Again, Krell was very useful in this. They provided a, a cloud-based uh, open drone map workflow. This is a uh, really really good way to to decrease the processing time of of all these pictures with around 1400 images if i were to run it on my 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 laptop which has around 16 gigs of ram it's it's a decent laptop but it would take around a week full straight processing fans running the whole time i was worried that the uh, computer was going to blow up randomly so thankfully this drastically decreased the time to six hours which actually able to uh, pump out the snow depth models uh, much faster than having them run on my local machine. And uh, these are just two of the figures that uh, print out from the report, just showing kind of where the GPSs are taken from and, and uh, the different camera locations. And with all this, I was getting around a 0 0.03 meter error, which is uh, pretty good for positional error with these large uh, zones. And as David mentioned earlier, very simple process to, to measure total snow depth. We have the DSM measures to the snow surface of any given day. Uh, uh, emphasize the importance of that baseline condition. That's that ground snow-free surface. We just do a simple raster calculator subtraction in QJS and we're left with the snowpack. Credit also to Zach Miller for these figures. They're really nice and slick. And uh, from his presentation, he's actually uh, works for the USGS now over in Montana, but he uh, did a um, he did a thesis on the similar uh, workflow methodology in the Bridger Range of Montana and got some really great results uh, from that. And snow depth change as well, really similar. But just the current snow depth minus the previous day leads to the the uh, change in snow depth, which is the really important factor because that's kind of what uh, that's what I'm interested in. Um, that's the snow depth change. That's where the wind slabs would show up or if they're scouring or melt, if there's any of that. So now here's the actual results themselves. It's just a little GIF showing the seasonal um, succession of the total snow depth. Uh, you can notice uh, the gullies obviously are where the snow is the greatest. So left gully is a good stripe there, shoot and, and center gully. And a uh, lip a little bit as well, but uh, the main depth uh, that's notable there is in Chicken Rock Gully, which is right where this uh, kind of the north, uh, middle upper part of the figure where it's that that brightest yellow in, in the end. That was upwards of 15 meters of snow depth, which is uh, what multiplied by three. That's that's uh, around 45 feet of snow uh, in the in the summertime. That's just a waterfall cliff area. So it definitely it just kind of folds. Uh, all the snow just blows into that gully, which is really interesting to actually measure it and see 15 meters is quite a bit. So that's uh, interesting. So next, uh, as Dave mentioned, it's really important to have some accurate assessment ground truthing involved. So with this campaign, I really, it was a bit lackluster, uh, in my opinion. I wish I prioritized doing a little bit more ground probing, but only got 21 depths over the course of the season from two days. And generally, uh, 0.5 R value is pretty suboptimal when it comes to statistics. Uh, you want something close to one. 
for them to be spot on. But uh, I think a lot of the error associated with this was the vegetation over probing and some of the interpenetrable ice layers. We love that uh, and impenetrable crusts and, and tucks. So sometimes they can't really probe through that. So that might get, throw some errors as well as probe angle. If I'm going down 150, 200 centimeters, there, it matters what kind of angle you're probing in. So sometimes that could throw it off as well. Uh, but also a lot of the times I was flying by myself and uh, I wear a beacon, but didn't always feel comfortable walking around in the center when I was measuring wind slabs when I could be be a product of one. So that was uh, the main problem with this uh, with this with this study. Next, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the useful tools I created. This is the Google Earth Engine, uh, as David was saying. It's, it's a great tool to code in an app that you can kind of show and, and share with, with the public. There's a QR code, but I'll also uh, throw it into the chat as well uh, if you'd like to view it uh, for yourself. It's a fairly... Uh, no, okay, I'll, I'll throw it in the... Yeah. Okay, it should be should be in there. Um, so this is just a app that I created that you can see all the different layers with and click around and get the depth yourself uh, through the season. Uh, and then also there is this new change view I didn't show before the results, but this is on a negative two to two meter scale. So you can see where it scoured or melted from and then also where that slab would, would reside. And then one of the really interesting parts of this, I think, is the ortho mosaic comparison. So I was able to use this slider tool and you can pick two days left and right panel. And then you can use this slider to slide between uh, the days and really see that difference. Uh, and this was actually after a, a natural avalanche cycle, a lot of, of things slid down from the head wall. And you can see a huge change in difference. A lot of the vegetation in the, in the run, floor run out area has been filled in. So that's really interesting to to see that depth uh, and that, just that change. And then here's that snow depth change map to back it up. There's around two meters of, of uh, depth increase in that in that region. So it's kind of cool to see a visual kind of lines up with these measurements that I'm, I'm producing. Next, I also have uh, the same sort of tool for, uh, for the Bootsburg Gullies area. And this was, uh, you can see a major change here. This is between the 1st of February and the 11th of February. And there's, uh, yeah, it's almost entirely filled in in the 11th. And this was actually the result of a natural avalanche that ran around a thousand, pretty much the full length of the of Hillman's. Uh, it was uh, around a four foot crown line, D2.5. So pretty sizable natural avalanche, uh, but it fills in car sized boulders uh, pretty easily. And I took this picture uh, from Brian Post. Uh, it was from the observations on on the, on the uh, Mount Washington Observatory or uh, Avalanche Center obser observations. So thank you for that. Just to illustrate crown lines up there, it kind of ran down all the way out of frame is, is where the where I was, the differences were showing. And here's that here's that snow depth map change, uh, the, the change map. You can see that two meters, that whole area that really filled in drastically is, is that huge, huge pocket of snow where everything ended up, which is interesting to see how that uh, really lined up with what we're seeing visually. Uh, but next, I'm going to talk a little bit about a rain event that happened. So uh, unfortunately, you hate to see rain in the winter, especially February, but it happened. So here's the Mount Washington Observatory's F6 form. They just post uh, daily things, daily weather, uh, but specifically looking at the uh, 17th and 18th around the middle of the month, uh, there were the highs of the day were 34, 38 or so. And the, we uh, got a quarter of an inch, half an inch of rain, a lot of rain, which is rain on snow is, is uh, can make some pretty crazy things happen. So uh, flew after that event happened and you can see a bunch of red here. It's a bunch of the melt happenings I'm scouring. And, and uh, a notable part about this that I'm going to mention is this really deep red pocket is a blowout. Uh, so the uh, this uh, Hillman's Highway gully is, is a riverbed, a uh, confluence in the in the summertime, and it actually ran again, and the huge chunks of snow and everything blew out of this area. And uh, this is a picture I took when I was when it refroze, but when I flew that day, uh, you can just see it really backs up how drastic of a change. You can see the kind of existing 
snow surface above it and then just a huge depth change there and it really shows up in the models as well uh, and next i just want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh another case study uh, wind slab formation here so this is uh just to the winter snow we have uh we have uh some snow accumulation happening between the 23rd and 30th and also a really big spike of wind and these plots are kind of hard to look at but Back again with the F6, uh, we see in the end of the month, uh, in that time, we have uh, around five centimeter, uh, five inch uh, snow accumulation and a couple more stravagular inches coming along. And then uh, 99, almost 100 mile an hour gusts uh, with those days to come, which is a sizable amount of wind blown out of the west. So so that really is gonna create some, some wind slabs on the Eastern aspects. And just to back that up, we really do see, this is a clear example of, you can see that kind of rotten bed surface, clear uh, visual change from where that new, really bright white uh, snow depth is. And that's that wind slab uh, that's really just very distinguishable. Here's that snow depth change map uh, from that day. And you can see almost exactly where this uh, pocket in Left Gully, the bottom run out of Left Gully is is almost uh, exactly there. So I didn't get the chance to measure the actual depth and see how the magnitude lined up, but at least the extent was uh, exactly where I where the uh, where it matches up with the optical. So I've ended up posting these results uh, to the Mount Washington Avalanche Center observations page. I include my snow change map as well as some some uh, orth mosaics to show the visual comparison and just a little write up about what I found and just what to avoid if uh, uh, just a re recommendation uh, kind of my, my goal is just to kind of uh, supplement and just add another tool in, in backcountry decision making uh, and actually a, a wet snow avalanche occurred so there is more rain or more more uh, warm weather caused uh, so it wasn't a dry release or it was natural as well on this but uh, it was a wet snow avalanche did occur uh, but the maps were still useful to see where this snow pocket was and where the change and where that depth and density differed from uh, the maps pre previously. So here's just a side by side of the uh, previous snow depth change map. You can see all those slabs, those blue areas where the snow is accumulated. And then on the right is the change between the after slide and uh, right before it. So so that you can see exactly where the snow ripped out from and then slid down to uh, with the debris pile showing up as the, the positive net there. So that's gonna kind of wrap up the end of my UAV results section. I'm gonna talk a little bit about snow model quickly. This is, uh, this is kind of where the research is moving. It's an ongoing effort, but snow models essentially, as, as David was saying, it's an analytical snow redistribution model. Uh, my main uh, interest is the snow tran. It's one of the layers. There's a lot of different layers of, uh, of how this all works, but essentially input data is spatially distributed topography, land cover, and meteorological data. And the outputs are snow depth, density, a few other things, but depth is the real, uh, real variable that I'm interested in. So snow tran 3D is the main, uh, the main component of this that uh, here's a great visualization of of how the snow is is transported and, and you can see it's really how the, the deposition happens on the on the uh down on the downwind side uh, which is exactly where it tucks is so um here's just a few different few different metrics that it kind of works in uh, so the main workflow uh for creating these models is uploading the i used a one meter uh grid cell which is the minimum, uh, it's, it's the finest resolution you can use for snow model. And, uh, and then I define the spatial extent and resolution process, the meteorological station data. I use uh, Mount Washington Observatory data on an a, uh, hourly basis, but I'm running it as a daily right now. Uh, and then I process it and then add, add the parameter file. There's a few different parameters you can get to shift things around and run it. So here's some of the output, this is a GIF from the season coinciding with the dates that I flew. Uh, this is kind of where my research uh, is le is ending up, is kind of moving towards, it's an ongoing effort to parameterize. You can see 10 meters of snow is, is kind of ridiculous uh, up above the ravine. Uh, I need to figure out how to push this, this depth down into the ravine more, but also 
the whole magnitude everywhere. We're not seeing five to seven and a half meters of snow, you know, in the floor by Hojo's. If we were, that Hojo's would be, would be buried. So uh, I didn't measure the snow fields or anything, but it makes sense why there's a lot of snow happening there, but I didn't measure it or have any, any measurements there. So it's tough to say if that's the actual magnitude, but I feel like 10 to 20 meters is a bit, a bit of an overestimation. So that's what I have now. My future work plan is going to be continuing to configure the, the model to further match the uh, UAV and snow depth data. Then in a perfect world, I'd like to run it in a forecasting sense with 48 hour NWS forecast data. Uh, and then also fly again uh, before and after and see how that all lines up and see if this snow model can be used as a forecasting sense instead of just a retrospective summary of the year. So a uh, quick conclusion here, uh, I conducted uh, a bunch of flights and uh, concluded that UAV collective structure for motion is an effective means of wind slab extent and depth detection. I uh, showed it with uh, a bunch of those maps there. There's a whole bunch of other ones to see. And, and I really invite you to, to check out that uh, app, the Google Earth engine I shared. Um, it's, it's really interesting to click around, and especially just look at the Earth mosaics and see uh, just how visually what changes through the days. Uh, and then also collecting UAV route uh, data in a mountainous area, especially Mount Washington, is very difficult and, and uh, labor intensive. So that's why a snow model is, is the, the missing piece there. But in order for it to be used, it needs further parameterization to be as useful as the UAV data. So that's uh, going to wrap it up for my presentation. I'd like to just thank a whole lot of people. Adam Hunsacker is a research partner at UNH. And for Jacobs is my advisor. Glenn Liston, uh, he's been a huge, tremendous help with the snow model uh, running. And also the whole uh, MWAC team, everyone's been very supportive. I'm really thankful for that. Adam LeWinter is a contact at Krell. He, he helped to operate the TLS and, and provide the ODM workflow, which has made everything very streamlined. And also everyone else that's uh, helped in the uh, really difficult data collection. A lot of uh, coworkers and friends have, have come up and, and and shivered up when we're trying to warm up batteries and warm up ourselves when we're just standing watching a, a drone fly around and also when people are skiing up there having a good time and wishing we were there too but there's other days so here's just a picture of the sled uh rigged up with the gear thank you for that and then just got a whole bunch of citations and now i'll uh thank you for listening i'll take any questions